Hello, my name is Raina Goldberg. I'm the Director of Leadership Engagement at ADL. Welcome to the ADL Task Force on Middle Eastern Minorities call on persecution in the time of COVID-19, Iran, its minorities, conspiracy theories, and its impact on the Middle East. Please be aware that this call is being recorded. After we hear from our speakers today, there will be an opportunity for Q&A. If you'd like to ask a question at any time during the call, simply open the chat box on the bottom of the Zoom program and type in your question. At this time, I'm pleased to introduce ADL's Senior Vice President for International Affairs and Director of ADL's Task Force on Middle East Minorities, Sharon Nazarian. Sharon, please go ahead. Thank you, Reina, and thank you to all for joining us for this important call. Uh, good morning to those of you on the West Coast, good afternoon to those of you on the East Coast, and good evening to those of you joining us in Europe, Iran, Israel, and beyond. Since its establishment in 1913, ADL has been a strong voice with a mission of stopping the defamation of Jewish people and to secure justice and fair treatment for all. Following our founding vision, ADL launched its first ever task force on Middle East minorities in 2018 with a mission of educating, advocating, and elevating the issues challenging these important and all too often overlooked communities across the Middle East, including religious, ethnic, sexual, and gender minorities, and other groups who face governmental and societal repression and discrimination. To that end, we work with a stellar group of scholars, journalists, and activists who are experts in what is happening in their minority communities and through their expertise have tremendous insights into what the international community and all of us can do to help. Today, you will hear from four of our experts in alphabetical order. First, Maziar Bahari is an Iranian Canadian journalist and filmmaker and a recipient of the Elie Wiesel Award. He was a reporter for Newsweek from 1998 to 2011, during which time he was jailed by the Iranian government in the infamous Evin prison for 118 days. His best-selling memoir from that time, Then They Came For Me, is the basis for John Stewart's 2014 film, Rosewater. Maziar is also the founder of IranWire.com, a forum that reaches millions of Iranians each month with objective news and provides training for Iranian journalists. Next, Dr. Ikon Ardemir is a senior director of FDD's Turkey program and a former member of the Turkish parliament. Ikon is an outspoken defender of pluralism, minority rights, and religious freedoms in the Middle East and has, had at the, has been at the forefront of the struggle against religious persecution hate crimes and hate speech in Turkey. Marjan Kapoor Grimblatt is a founder and director of the Alliance for Rights of Minorities, ARAM, a nonprofit organization which promotes human rights in Iran. As a former refugee from Iran herself who escaped discrimination in the Middle East and Europe, her career has focused on advocacy for human rights and advancement of dem democratic ideals. She has led advocacy and educational efforts on behalf of women, LGBT groups, religious and ethnic minorities in the US and in Iran. And finally, Reverend Johnny Moore, who is a commissioner on the US Commission on International Religious Freedom, USERF. He is a founder and CEO of the Kairos Company and president of the Congress of Christian Leaders. Johnny is a strong advocate for religious freedom in the Middle East meeting on multiple occasions with religious leaders, including most heads of states across the Arab and Muslim world. So welcome to you all, and thank you for taking the time to be with us. The global pandemic has posed unprecedented challenges to governments and societies around the world. We all know that. Since the start of this pandemic, though, the Islamic Republic of Iran has responded to the medical, societal, and economic challenges of COVID-19 by doubling down on scapegoating minorities in order to whitewash the state's own governance failures, as well as continuing to propagate anti-Jewish and anti-Israel conspiracy theories. So with that, we will start um, with our panel, and maybe Johnny, we'll start with you. 
by really looking at these unprecedented challenges that the minorities in the Middle East are facing today, and particularly in Iran, under authoritarian, authoritarian governments, who really are using COVID-19 as both a mechanism to deflect their own policy failures in responding to this really global pandemic, but also as a convenient tool to further oppress and marginalize their own minorities. So Johnny, if you could start please by setting the stage for us a little bit about Middle East broadly speaking and what you as a religious leader yourself are seeing and the patterns that you're seeing in the Middle East, please. Uh, thank, thank you, Dr. Nazarian. Thanks uh, for uh, the, the opportunity for all of us to be here and address this important uh, topic uh, today. Uh, the, the fact of the matter is uh, that from a religious freedom perspective, uh, it is okay for a government to, um, to limit religious freedom under certain circumstances for the public good, but they have to do it equally. They have to treat similar activities equally, they treat all religious communities equally, uh, and, and uh, they cannot do it arbitrarily. And, and what, we're, what we're seeing, not, not just in the Middle East, by the way, but what we're seeing all across uh, the world is uh, in authoritarian environments. Many of these governments have sort of lapsed to their worst instincts. Uh, that, that, that would be one trend that we've noticed at the U.S. Commission for International Religious Freedom. They, they sort of defaulted to their old habits of handling problems and sometimes in the most egregious form. Uh, another, another trend that we've seen is uh, th this is a part of the world actually that was uh, experiencing a, a surprising amount of progress when it came to religious freedom and, and in some cir circumstances other human rights. Uh, but because of addressing the COVID-19 crisis, we have seen some of that progress uh, slow. Some of it is because of the former reason, and some of it is just just with the limited capacity these governments have to address this sort of once in a century problem. Uh, the, the, any any trend towards modernization has has sometimes become a very quickly a lesser priority. Uh, as you as you rightly mentioned, you know another observation that we've had is that minorities are often the scapegoats, uh, and this happens in all kinds of different ways. Uh, we we saw it in Cambodia, for instance, when the first patients. Uh, were Muslims. And so there was anti-Muslim rhetoric that came from the government. We saw it uh, with uh, the certain communities in Pakistan and Afghanistan, Shia communities in Pakistan and uh, Afghanistan. Uh, we, we've, we've seen, um, we, we've seen uh, Christians uh, in Iran uh, be treated in absolutely in, incomprehensible ways in all kinds of different ways. In fact, when other prisoners have been released, the, Christ the Christians have, have been forced to stay. When underground Christians, converts from, from Islam to Christianity in, in Iran, decided that it was more important that they serve their community that was in need than it was to uh, protect themselves against the government because of, their, because of their conversion, they sort of came out as Christians in order to serve other people. Uh, and the government responded by raids on Christian homes uh, and, and, uh, and arbitrary uh, detention. Th those, are, those are some of the trends. Uh, that we've seen around the world. The fact of the matter though, to summarize it all, is uh, governments have responded badly uh, when it comes to religious freedom and human rights. And they have unfortunately in many circumstances used uh, this tragedy as an excuse uh, for political uh, and religious repression. Thank you, Johnny. That's very wonderful setting the stage for us. And um, for us to now zoom into Iran more specifically, I'm gonna turn to Mazia Bahari. Mazir, can you tell us a little bit about how the Islamic Republic of Iran has really reacted to COVID-19 and how is it uh, using this opportunity in terms of further furthering its own agenda? Sure, thank you very much for inviting me to this uh, amazing panel. I think the uh, coronavirus and the spread of the pandemic in Iran has to do with two questions, the question of legitimacy and the question of power. And when you look at the four main reasons for the spread of the virus in Iran, namely the insistence of the regime to hold the 20th anniversary, I mean, the 41st anniversary of the 1979 revolution, holding the elections of the parliament in uh, February, and the fact that because of Iran's strategic alliance with China, they were really late in terms of stopping the flow of Chinese uh, tourists and 
uh, travelers from China into Iran, and the most importantly, the fact that they wanted to keep the city of Qom, where the first uh, patients of COVID-19 were seen and treated, uh, they wanted to keep the city of Qom, which is the bastion of Shism in Iran open. These four factors uh, show that the COVID-19, the spread of the pandemic, the spread of the virus, and, and containing the virus has to do with the legitimacy of the regime and the power. So the situation of the minorities in Iran is getting worsened because whatever uh, bad characteristics of the regime that we knew in the past and the uh, horrible treatment of the minorities that we knew about in the past, as Johnny mentioned, in intensified during the pandemic. So for example, the Baha'i prisoners, the Baha'is are the largest religious minority in Iran. The Baha'i prisoners uh, in Iran, they have, been, they have not been treated uh, because in, of, the, of COVID-19, the spread of COVID-19 inside prisons. The Baha'is were not allowed furlough to, to go out as many other prisoners because the Baha'is and members of other religious minorities, including the uh, Christian converts, they are regarded as security prisoners. And these security prisoners, they also include uh, many dual nationals and foreign nationals who are in prison in Iran, including nine environmental activists. And because of the inefficient way that the government of Iran responded to the pandemic in the beginning and the spread of the virus across all 31 provinces of Iran, now there is a struggle. There is an inner battle between the Iranian government, the official government of President Hassan Rouhani and the Revolutionary Guards in order to contain the pandemic and take credit for it. And again, many people who were victims of both uh, sides in the past, especially the victims of the Revolutionary Guards, they are becoming even more victimized. And the Revolutionary Guards now, they are taking over from the official Ministry of Health in Iran. And they are dealing with the death certificates. They are dealing with the uh, local doctors. They are asking local doctors to uh, go through their channels in order to uh, treat the patients and contain the pandemic. So uh, I cannot see a specific targeting of the minorities in a sense that they are like targeting the Jews or Christians or Baha'is specifically uh, because of the COVID-19, but their worst characteristics of the regime is becoming worsened. And at the same time, as many other countries in the region, as many other countries around the world, some of the misinformation, some of the disinformation is spread um, in Iranian media as well. Before the meeting, I just did a quick Google search about uh, Zionism and, uh, and conspiracy theory and coronavirus, and I came up with uh, five or six articles within like a few seconds. I just wanted to see how many articles were there. The first one is from the uh, Iran's official news agency, and it says one third of the Pakistanis say that the coronavirus is an American Zionist conspiracy. Another, uh, another um, uh, article from a, a Revolutionary Guard Associated website, Khabar Online, it says that the many uh, people in the UK are saying that the Coronavirus, that coronavirus is a Jewish conspiracy theory. And the funny thing about this article is that it says people were asked whether it's a Jewish conspiracy theory or not, and 80% said, no, it is not. But still, the headline is that the, uh, it is. And then there is another article that, the, uh, that Bibi Netanyahu uh, uses the coronavirus and the pandemic as a way to annex the uh, West Bank, which we know that it's not true. And uh, we know that the spread of uh, the pandemic in Israel has caused a lot of uh, grief for Prime Minister Netanyahu and has caused many protests across Israel. 
So on uh, the face of it, maybe these uh, media reports are not important, but when uh, Baha'i uh, prisoners, when Christian converts, when people who have any, who have shown any kind of sympathy to, uh, to the state of Israel go to prison, they can be, these articles can be used against them and can be put, uh, can be, be part of the, uh, the prosecutor's uh, case against these people. Thank you, Mazia. That's really uh, wonderful diving into to what is really the situation facing minorities in Iran. Marjan, you've spent a lot of time really uh, covering the plight of different ethnic um, and religious minorities in Iran. What is your view on this in terms of what COVID has done to the struggle of uh, Iran's very diverse ethnic and religious makeup? Um, yes, thank you so much for the opportunity to be among this panel and uh, to serve on the ADL Task Force for, uh, for Middle East Minorities. Um, so as you mentioned, yes, Iran is a very diverse country and um, the diversity, unfortunately, is being um, one of the causes for discrimination and division inside the country. And as uh, Maziar mentioned, um, the problems that inflicted the people of Iran and the minorities have just worsened. So um, the uh, health minister of Iran, who, by the way, was downplaying the impact and the danger of COVID uh, before he got sick himself, um, has announced uh, seven major provinces where the uh, pandemic has hit the hardest, and he is uh, referring to them as the red zones. And interestingly, those red zones happen to be, at least uh, the majority of the red zones are um, locations where um, the majority of ethnic populations are residing. For example, um, if you look at Kermanshah, where there's a significant Kurdish population um, and, and Sunni population, um, it is one of the top um, red zones. So what all of these red zones, by the way, have in common is that even before COVID-19 hit these regions, these regions were significantly neglected. They were deprived both in terms of infrastructure and economics and also unattended when there was a natural disaster that hit these regions. So many of us remember the uh, very uh, impactful earthquake that hit the Kurdistan region of um, uh, uh, Sarpol uh, Zahab, the Kurdish region of Sarpol Zahab in 2017. Um, sadly, the government has neglected a prop, uh, this, this region and failed to provide proper response and assistance to these areas. And three years after the earthquake, there are still people who are living in tents. Um, and the economic impact um, and the lack of economic resources and um, uh, lack of jobs have already made these regions very weak. But now with the impact of COVID, it's only worsening the situation. Similarly, in the Sistan and Baluchistan region and um, the Hormozgan province, uh, where the Baluchi and Sunni populations reside, again, these regions were gripped by addiction, poverty, unemployment, high rates of arrest and execution already. Um, so Sistan and Baluchistan regions, because of lack of irrigation and lack of planting and really a tendance to the land have been hit by previously by sandstorms, um, making many of the population, many of the uh, residents very uh, prone to respiratory diseases. And now this region is identified as a red zone. So people who already have a precondition for respiratory diseases are even more vulnerable um, and they are now dealing with this new pandemic. Um, the Arab populated region of Khuzestan, um, which ironically is one of the richest um, regions of Iran because of its abundant oil, um, 
they're, they are struggling, even before the COVID um, pandemic hit the region. Um, they were lacking clean water. Um, there are people who had sent videos of themselves uh, trying to wash their hands and the water would be brown and black coming out of these spats. Now they are giving instructions to these communities to wash hands and to have social distancing, but they are not really acknowledging the day-to-day -day problems where with the poverty, when how can you have social distancing when you live in a tent? How can you wash hands when you don't have access to clean water? And they never provided masks or stopped the problems um, that were endangering people with respiratory illnesses in Sistan and Baluchistan. Now, where are they going to get masks from right now? Of course, the locals are very, um, innovative and they're trying to solve their own problems. The children are making masks. They're not, not, not in schools right now. Um, or, you know, they're not, there's not really a school building to speak for even before COVID-19. Um, and they are trying to solve their own problems, but they're facing significant problems. One last thing to, to mention about Sistan and Baluchistan region is that this area is so deprived, is so neglected and the poverty rate is, is so intense that many of the reporters don't even go to do uh, the proper reporting. If you look at um, statistics uh, measuring the level of pandemic in the, in the country, oftentimes they're leaving out Sistan and Baluchistan altogether, not because there is no, um, no, no infection rates in this region, but because reporters don't, don't want to go, they don't want to really uh, roll up their sleeves and, and really face the, um, the, the devil that exists in those regions. Um, one thing that I want to mention about the, the, the religious minorities before um, we move on to other panelists. As, um, as Reverend Moore mentioned, um, the rate of despite the deplorable prison conditions and of course we know that prisons are not hygiene um, centers anywhere in the world but the prisons in iran have um are, are, are really experienced, have, even before COVID, had dealt with significant challenges, um, lack of clean water, overcrowding, um, high rate of uh, inmates with AIDS and hepatitis, making them more immunocompromised than at risk of contracting and spreading the virus. Um, and um, they are not giving any opportunities for furlough and release of um, some of the religious minorities who want to um, at least go on breaks. Um, there, and this has caused significant riots in prisons. Most notably, um, there, there was in the Kurdish region, there was a riot and, and some of the inmates escaped. And of course, one of the inmates, um, and they cannot go far, one of the inmates um, was uh, captured and later executed for, for attempting to escape this, this, this deplorable condition. And even when these um, religious minorities are released, um, after serving unfair and long sentences, they are not allowed to go back to their communities to be with their families and with their religious space. They are actually exiled. And where are they exiled? Interestingly, they're exiled in these hot zones where COVID-19 is rampant and they are not um, and, and not only they're singled out because they're religious minorities, but they're also singled out, they're, they're also exposed to the virus. Wow, thank you, Marjan. That's really a very, very insightful and, and interesting information that's not really readily available to us on the, in the West. Um, so thank you for that. I wanna turn to uh, Maikan Erdemir. Um, as a former member of uh, Turkish parliament and as really a Turkey analyst icon, um, we've seen that uh, the government of Turkey has tried to use COVID both in terms of pursuing its own foreign policy uh, agenda in the Middle East, using kind of a charm offensive by really showing that it's gonna show up for the, uh, and assist other governments, specifically Iran as well, but also domestically in terms of how it's impacted um, its own population and where President Erdogan sees itself politically um, and how COVID is helping or not helping with his uh, own firm on, on uh, control on power. If you could uh, talk a little bit about Turkey-Iran uh, dynamic here and also how Turkey is dealing with its own religious minorities internally as they watch each other do that. 
please unmute yourself, Icon. Thank you, Sharon, for the opportunity to uh, address this distinguished audience. Um, now, Turkey and Iran uh, offer a very interesting parallel because on the one hand, we have a key adversary to the United States and NATO. And on the other hand, we have a NATO member state, a treaty uh, ally to the United States. But interestingly, these two authoritarian regimes, which have you know, conflicting hegemonic ambitions in the Middle East and beyond, you know, Iran being the leading Shiite power, Turkey trying to become the leading Sunni power, they increasingly converge on multiple levels. And COVID-19 uh, brought out these, highlighted these convergences to a great extent. Uh, when we take a look at what took place in Turkey, it's almost like a mirror image of what has been happening in Iran, meaning uh, the Turkish government has used the pandemic uh, to further consolidate uh, its you know, chokehold on Turkish democracy, similar to Iran, its scapegoated religious minorities, Christians and Jews, as well as sexual minorities, the LGBTI community, to deflect blame. Uh, it also looked for opportunities beyond Turkish borders through either proxy wars or military involvement uh, to uh, you know, provide a, an image of strength back at home. And all of these are extremely parallel in both countries. In fact, Turkey and Iran almost simultaneously took steps to consolidate government control over their bar associations and independent lawyers. So one could argue that this is pure coincidence or one could argue that there is a, a deeper logic behind this. And I would like to argue that the deeper logic behind this is a structural issue. That is, you know, these, uh, you know, leading hegemonic powers in the Middle East uh, who are proud of their strong militaries and paramilitary forces and their repressive apparatuses actually are very weak when it comes to governance, when it comes to public policy, when it comes to health, public health policy, and when it comes to uh, economy and finance. So uh, both regimes, uh, as they fail to deliver when it comes to either uh, you know, COVID-19 measures, when it comes to you know, uh, maintaining peace and prosperity, when it comes to providing you know, uh, hope for the future, they then turn to these other mechanisms to first deflect blame from their own shortcomings, second, uh, scapegoat and point the finger uh, to ethnic, religious, and sexual minorities, and third, uh, as they always do, see this as an opportunity as much as a threat. That is, every time responsible uh, you know, uh, civil servants and political leaders in democratic countries you know, see a threat. Authoritarian regimes see an opportunity. They say, okay, how can we emerge from this with greater concentration of power, with a greater crackdown on dissidents, with a greater opportunity to expand our influence in the region? In fact, um, it, it didn't take long before the IRGC and the Turkish military, which happened to be fighting a proxy war in Syria's Idlib region, to carry out a joint operation in Iraqi Kurdistan, a coordinated military operation against their respective Kurdish insurgents. And this was multiple wins in one, because they were not only coordinating their military efforts against their own insurgent Kurds, but at the same time, they were both undermining the Kurdistan regional government at their own expense, while also undermining Iraqi sovereignty, thereby giving each actor greater footprint in Iraqi politics. So this is a very sophisticated, you know, domestic and international and military policy, you know, where, you know, responsible leaders would be fully you know, focused on uh, public health and economic policy. Here we see authoritarian leaders and regimes focusing on maximizing their sheer, you know, personal or factional interests. So I think that's what we see as a, a worrying sign 
uh, in, in both Iran and Turkey. And I think what's uh, for us to think deeper on is how did it come to this, that we now talk about a Middle East where the leading state sponsor of terrorism, you know, the leading threatening force to ethnic, religious, and sexual minorities in the Middle East, namely the, the Islamic Republic of Iran, is increasingly in convergence with the second military power in NATO. You know, a, a longtime member of the Council of Europe, an accession, you know, a candidate country to the European Union, you know, and, and, and a key uh, US strategic ally. So this shows us that beyond um, the conventional wisdom about, you know, the, the, the historic Turkish-Iranian rivalry or the sectarian competition between Shiite and Sunni powers, we are entering a, a new moment in history whereby authoritarian regimes are inc increasingly collaborating, you know, uh, evading US sanctions together, carrying out military operations together, providing one another intel, and cracking down in a coordinated manner uh, on their minorities and on their dissident populations, which also then, uh, and let me ask, uh, end with this question, which also begs us to question new ways of dealing these new kind of threats we're not that used to. So as these new alliances are being forged, the key question for policymakers is, how can we develop comprehensive strategies to deal with these new kinds of threats uh, and risks that we see in the Middle East? Thank you, Icon, and really, really, truly interesting in terms of the regional dynamic and the uh, uh, the interaction between Turkey and Iran in this moment. Uh, I do want to go back to the panel and turn to the narrative that these authoritarian regimes are using. And of course, um, conspiracy theories, misinformation is nothing new to the region. These are not tools that have been just recently adopted by these governments. But what we at ADL have been monitoring and seeing is that the, the rhetoric, the level of rhetoric is now reaching new heights. The targeting and scapegoating of uh, religious minorities and for our interest specifically against Jews, so anti-Semitic rhetoric, um, scapegoating of Israel specifically um, is really reaching new heights and we are obviously very concerned about that. Um, I want to go back to, uh, to Johnny and see in terms of what you're seeing across the Middle East um, by all governments, but if you have also insights onto Iran, how um, scapegoating of religious minorities is uh, part of a mechanism that authoritarian regimes are using more and more today in order to um, scapegoat uh, uh, vulnerable communities in their, in their country. How are you seeing that play out? Well, well I, I should say that the situation has revea revealed all kinds of things. You know, so, so for instance, uh, not only ha have, have we seen Iran exhibiting its, its worst instincts, and what I said earlier is true, we're seeing a lot of these other regimes also defaulting to their worst instincts. On the same token, we're actually seeing uh, some surprises uh, which have inflamed uh, the anti-Semitism uh, and, and anti-Zionism from Iran, for instance. So when the UAE emits this crisis, uh, you know, began to send out humanitarian assistance all around the world to dozens and dozens and dozens of countries. That humanitarian assistance included a marked Emirates airline flight uh, to Tel Aviv with assistance for the, for the Palestinians that was rejected by um, uh, Abbas and, and in turn sent to, to Gaza. And what did that do? Right? Uh, it, it, you know, it, it absolutely, uh, it, 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 caused Iran to lose their mind. It, we, we saw the, the Turkish rhetoric increase. Si simultaneously, you, you also see other sort of interesting dynamics to where, you know, we're seeing these instincts, but we're also seeing some of the changes sticking, for instance, in Saudi Arabia, right? Where when, when they did, in the, in the middle of Hajj, close down the mosque in Mecca, you know, conventional wisdom would have said that this uh, this ins religiously incendiary country would have just blown up not having access to Mecca. Uh, and yet what we actually saw is we didn't see that happen. So as Maziar referenced, 
you know, the, the, the Iranians government refusal to, um, to, uh, to limit religious activities in Qom uh, was an accelerant to the virus. You know, in, in Saudi Arabia, we saw, we saw sort of the opposite. We saw the Saudis, you know, stop in the middle of the most important time of the year for, for Muslims all around the world, limit those activities. And not only did the country not blow up, uh, which, which might, you know, which might demonstrate that there is more of a appetite for change, you know, in, in, in the region. But, but all across the board, when things became complicated, okay, when people were dissatisfied, when the numbers were ticking up, the default reaction was as it has often been the case. Uh, this whole problem exists because of the Americans and because of Israel. And if there's a Jew or Christian in sight, they must somehow be responsible for this. Uh, and and the, the rhetoric uh, was, uh, was incendiary to put it lightly, but, but even more so, it enabled other things to happen. So let me give one final example so I don't, I don't ramble here. Um, but the Baha'i uh, and, the, and, the, and the Jewish community in Yemen uh, were, were subject to particular uh, vicious attacks over the course of COVID-19. In fact, there was a Baha'i prisoner that I've personally been advocating for in my position on USERF. Uh, the, the court uh, ruled that he could, he could leave prison. He's not been allowed to leave prison. And the, one of the reasons why he hasn't been allowed to leave prison is because the Houthis are still looking towards Iran uh, for, for leadership. The, the very few Jews left in, a, in, in Iran were subject to discrimination in the last, in the last couple of weeks. And so it's a, it's a complex picture uh, where uh, you, you see what is changing and what isn't changing uh, in, in the region as the COVID-19 problem persists. Maziar, um, the Islamic Republic of Iran has used misinformation in order to kind of justify um, its own failures for a long time, over the past 40 years. That's, again, nothing new. Yeah. But we're, use, we're seeing the government now use, I mean, issues like genies being at play. Uh, Jewish and Zionist genies are the ones who are behind this virus. Talk to us about the efficacy of, and of such scapegoating and these conspiracy theories. How is it serving the regime right now? Yeah, I think uh, what ICON said about uh, dictatorial countries and authoritarian regimes using disaster as an opportunity in most cases is true. But I think the Iranian government wished that coronavirus pandemic did not happen because the pandemic happened after two major disasters for the Iranian government. One was the uh, November protest in November 2019 protest in Iran, which resulted in killing of hundreds of protesters by the regime. And then the killing of Soleimani and shooting down of the passenger airplane by the Revolutionary Guards, which resulted in protests uh, in Iran and around the world and delegitimizing the regime even further. So I think in their heart of hearts, they would have wished that the pandemic would not happen. So they were caught uh, somehow off guard and their default position was to ignore the problem and their default position was to suppress uh, the usual suspects, including uh, uh, religious and ethnic minorities, especially because the ethnic minorities in Iran, they live on the border areas, which are regarded as uh, geographically sensitive areas in Iran including the Baluchistan province, Sistan and Baluchistan province that Marjan mentioned and Kurdistan uh, province that is, has borders with uh, Iraq. So I think the Iranian government's misinformation could have been more anti-Zionist and anti-Jewish and anti-Semitic in a sense, but I think they're in their haste in order to come up with some sort of conspiracy theory to justify the pandemic, they resorted to a convergence with the Russian and Chinese uh, disinformation campaign. So as you know, Russian and Chinese disinformation campaign is more anti-American rather than anti-Semitic or anti-Zionist. And that is the trend really that we see in Iran these days that the 
uh, conspiracy theories, the disinformation, the misinformation that we see uh, in Iran is a uh, is a way much closer to Russian and Chinese disinformation campaigns. And the fact that they are questioning the liberal democracies, they're questioning the fact that the, uh, in, uh, they're saying that in uh, Western uh, democracies, they're allowing old people to die and we respect our old people. There was another article that I just found uh, that the Iranian, uh, Speaker of the Parliament said that this pandemic shows two different values, the our values and the Western values. We respect our uh, elders and they don't, they just want their elders to die. So I think uh, uh, if they had the time, if the protest did not happen and the shooting down of the passenger airplane and killing dozens of people in that plane did not happen, maybe we would see more anti-Semitic and more anti-Israeli uh, conspiracy theory coming out of Iran. But I think they just don't know what to do. And so their default position is just uh, repeating the, regurgitating in a sense, the Russian and Chinese disinformation. Thank you. Um, Marjan, we saw um, in the last few months uh, kind of a pattern of attacking religious sites in Iran where um, the tomb of Esther and Mordechai uh, had a fire. There were a couple of cemeteries that were Hindu cemeteries that were on fire and a few Christian sites. Generally speaking, um, conspiracy theories and scapegoating of religious minorities in Iran. Tell me a little bit about kind of your perspective on it and how uh, this regime that has used this technique often is now stepping up and really targeting religious minorities um, in order to kind of have this narrative of deflecting um, its own failure. How is that showing up in your work? Sure. So let me just pick up actually where Mazier left off. And in terms of um, where I see the use of um, conspiracy theories and divisive language. Um, I think that um, in addition to the disinformation that um, they are very dependent upon and um, Russia and China are providing it for them very easily, um, there, there is also you know, a, a, an alternative way of looking at it. Thankfully, um, the Iranian people, despite all the restrictions, are able to access information on their own and they're able to um, use their critical thinking and their own, and, and they have reached the point where they really want to hold their governments accountable for, for their failures and for their uh, persistent neglect um, of their interests. Um, they are seeing that their interests are being uh, paid outside of the country instead of investments inside the country. Um, so despite the existence of these div 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 divisive languages, you know, whether, whether, whether they're targeting American, the Western cultures, or they're targeting Jews and Israel, um, they, um, the people are starting to see the difference. And there is, a, there is um, more of a desire for, for unity inside Iran. Um, I don't know if the audience uh, has probably noticed that the protests are continuing um, again um, in Iran, and some of them are with mass mass protesters, others are without, and um, there is really no amount of disinformation and propaganda that can keep the struggle and the suffering and frustration that the Iranian people are experiencing um, hidden and quiet. So what I would say um, in terms of um, use of material is also that the Iranian the regime is frustrated because it doesn't have its propaganda hubs in the mosques anymore. So they are not able to gather people around to feed their minds with whatever they want to say in, you know, in the age of social distancing and physical distancing. Yes, they control the media. Yes, they have tons of in, uh, false lies and forced confessions and other things airing in the media on a day-to-day -day basis. But they have to utilize more incendiary material, um, whether it is anti-Israel, anti-Jewish, or um, material used by, by the Russians and the Chinese to really have more of an impact um, in the absence of their physical um, um, distribution of propaganda. So, um, 
the attacks that happened um, in April um, were very concerning. So um, over the course of three days, um, the uh, the, one of the most revered Jewish sites, the burial ground of Esther and Mordechai, um, was uh, there was an attempted arson, um, or there was an arson, there was an arson in the building adjacent, um, that really shook the community, uh, the Jewish community internationally, and um, that su uh, su Sunday there was a fire and, and two cemeteries, two Christian cemeteries. Um, outside of Tehran, and then there was also a Buddhist temple that caught fire. So um, the pattern that we saw during that those those course of three days was very concerning. Of course, among the messages that the Iranian regime loves to send abroad is their wonderful treatment of the religious minorities in the country. Um, they like to talk about um, how they have given freedom and privileges to a handful of um, religious minorities in the country while they actually have left off a significant other population from any privileges whatsoever, like the Bonabadi Darvishes and like the Baha'is and those who are converting. So um, they try to really act quickly, especially when it uh, was in response to the uh, the Jewish side of the Esther and Mordechai, they tried to respond quickly. Um, they documented that the, the, the damage to the site very significantly to show that uh, thankfully, not that much damage had been caused and they're going to take care of it, um, etc. So um, was there a causality with the coronavirus that, that led to these arsons? I could not say. But um, does it put those minority communities on higher alert? Absolutely. That's very helpful. So Icon, what is it about conspiracy theories in the Middle East? Of course, no other region of the world is really immune to, to this tactic, unfortunately. But there is something about um, the prevalence of conspiracy theories in the Middle East. Uh, what, what are your thoughts on that? I know that you know, in Turkey also, this is something that's very prevalent. And, and one of the questions we're going to turn now to, to the questions from the audience, but one of the first questions I saw is, what is it about um, the, the fact that conspiracy theories are, have been such a relevant part of, of Middle East culture in some ways, and as I said, not immune only to Middle East. And then today, why is it that there's a greater blame on Jews and on Israel and not on China? Uh, what are your thoughts about that kind of icon from your perspective? You could uh, unmute yourself. Thank you again for this question. Um, uh, as, as someone who also researched some of these conspiracy theories for his PhD dissertation uh, during his work on Turkey's Alawite religious minority, uh, one thing I've come across is, first of all, these conspiracy theories in the Middle East uh, cross boundaries. So they're everywhere in, in the Persian speaking, Turkish speaking, Arabic speaking, Kurdish speaking regions of the Middle East. Second, uh, these theories are quite timeless. For example, one conspiracy theory about the sexual promiscuity of minorities, uh, I could trace it all the way from, you know, Sasanid texts to Seljuk texts to Ottoman uh, writings against the Alawites, and then all the way to Cold War propaganda against Turkey's communists. So it, it seems these theories have a life of their own that can, um, you know, uh, skip generations and empires and, na na and na nation states. Uh, and it's important to realize that this repertoire is there to begin with, meaning these authoritarian regimes don't invent theories out of the blue. You know, it would be quite challenging to build an entire new theory about the Norwegian threat, right, in the Middle East. Whereas, it's always easier to tap into existing repertoires and strengthen them, propagate them. And hence, I call this the vicious cycle of conspiracy theories. That is, on the one hand, there is uh, you know, a, 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 um, a, a long-term repertoire that resonates strongly with local communities. But at the same time, we see a state-sanctioned, state-sponsored nurturing of those conspiracy theories and uh, and they reinforce one another and hence the vicious circle and 
that's why I would argue that in Iran or in Turkey, you know, tackling some of these conspiracies and, uh, and anti-Semitism being uh, one, one of the biggest, uh, at, at, at the core of these conspiracy theories, uh, it takes a, a, a multi-pronged approach. That is, we need to target both the state level, you know, leadership level, sanctioning, propagation, and sponsoring of conspiracy theories, which requires, you know, um, you know, changing governments, bringing in uh, democratic, pluralist, accountable governments to power, changing legislation and constitutions. But at the same time, it requires engaging at the grassroots level, because as long as the repertoire is there, as long as uh, there is this grassroots uh, feeding and reproducing of these theories, uh, they might come back again. Hence, the need for a comprehensive strategy, uh, the need for a, a transnational strategy, because we can't just tackle this in Iran or Turkey or in Iraq alone, uh, because it, it, it'll come back in uh, as it has always done so. It has crossed imperial boundaries, nation state boundaries, linguistic and religious boundaries. So uh, the, the challenge is uh, a, a mighty challenge. Uh, and, and the response therefore needs to be a, a robust, comprehensive, multi-pronged uh, response. And le let me end with the, 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 one of the, the key conspiracy theories at hand we have, and that is uh, anti-Semitism. You know, uh, the tendency in Iran and Turkey uh, to tie pretty much all challenges and ills uh, to a nefarious Jewish or Zionist uh, conspiracy. And uh, for uh, those in the audience, one interesting fact is, according to ADL's own polls uh, over the years, the Turkish public harbors more anti-Semitic sentiments than the Iranian public. So this is not purely a, a, a regime matter. That is, you know, the Islamic Republic of Iran did not manage to create a more anti-Semitic society than the NATO member state Turkey. So hence, regardless of regime or, you know, government type, there could be stronger grassroots uh, repertoires around anti-Semitism. And this is also something to keep in mind. And, uh, and also the uh, the key aspect about anti-Semitism is it gets a new life uh, with each new political uh, episode. That is, uh, for example, during the Cold War, some of the existing Islamist and ultra-nationalist repertoires about uh, Jews and Zionists and, and Israel were reinforced by some new radical left uh, ideologies and conspiracy theories about th the same groups. So uh, there is not just one source of these conspiracies and they can be instrumentalized, reproduced, refashioned by different actors, factions, ideologies, and hence it requires, uh, you know, an alliance across faiths, across ethnicities, across nation states and ideologies uh, to tackle these challenges uh, in an effective manner. Thank you, Ayukan. Very well put. Johnny, did you want to jump in? Uh, yeah, ha happy, happy to. Uh, I think a key uh, and important factor here, as, as Maziar cited, is uh, the, the parroting of Chinese propaganda as it relates to the virus uh, is maybe one of the five most important factors when you're looking at the whole, um, the whole aspect of this all, all around the world. The, the Iranian regime is weakening for two reasons. Number one, uh, just last week, uh, the, the particularly careful foreign minister uh, was, was totally out of character when he uh, spoke uh, defending his own reputation in front of the parliament in Iran as a, def as a friend of Soleimani. I met with Soleimani every week. So the moderate side of the regime is crumbling. And then the extremist religious side of the regime is crumbling because they are so incredibly desperate 
that they will take any dollar they possibly can and propagate any message they possibly can while the Chinese Communist Party simultaneously inters over a million Uyghurs and leads them blindfolded into, into trains. And so one of the things that COVID has revealed, uh, perhaps more than anything else, um, is how weak authoritarians actually are uh, when they have to face something unexpected. And it puts on all of us an extra responsibility to do our part, uh, to, to uh, not be exploited ourselves, uh, but along the way to, uh, to, to make sure we help the, uh, the, the, most, the most innocent, and particularly those crying for freedom in their own countries. Oh, that's very well put. Maziard, uh, did, did you want to jump in and add a little bit more about kind of the use of uh, conspiracy theories at this moment and where this regime is standing? Is it weak? Uh, as, as Johnny says, is it a weakening regime or is it in fact strengthening itself through, through some of these tactics? Where would you come down on that? Uh, the regime is definitely weak and it's becoming weaker every day because people are realizing and by people I mean both peop uh, ordinary Iranians who are not part of the regime but also different parts of the regime ordinary people who are member rank and file of the revolutionary guards the so-called reformists people who were part of the regime in the past they are realizing how inefficient, how ineffective, and how corrupt the regime is. And one of the signs of the corruption of the regime is that uh, there are many people who were part of the regime, uh, including the one of the deputies of the head of the judiciary is on trial now. The daughter of a minister was on trial recently. The son-in-law of the same minister has uh, gone missing. And people, so people are realizing uh, how ineffective and how inefficient uh, the regime is. So the most uh, expedient thing to do for such regimes is just to resort to conspiracy theories. And I see that there is a question from one of the audience members about China specifically uh, to talk about the agreement with China. And I think that uh, it also shows how uh, ineffective the regime is, that uh, the Islamic Republic of Iran has been talking about our Muslim brothers and uh, sisters in Palestine for the past 41 years. Why? Because the Israelis are oppressing our Muslims and brothers in Palestine. But the other Muslim uh, sisters and brothers in Chechnya or other Muslim brother, Muslim sisters and brothers in China, the Uyghurs have been massacred, have been put in concentration camps by the Russian and the uh, Chinese regimes. And the Iranian uh, government has not said anything. They did not, they were silent when the Russians were massacring uh, the Chinese and they have been silent when uh, the uh, Chinese have been putting uh, the Uyghurs uh, in concentration camps. So we know, um, but I'm not telling you anything new now because we know that regime is hypocritical, this, we know that the regime is inefficient, but uh, I guess the question that uh, many people in the audience will have is, what should be done? What should the international community should do in order to uh, somehow have a peaceful uh, uh, process of the power uh, shifting from this regime to the other regime. And I think that is the multi-billion dollar question that we are talking about. And that is one of the reasons that the regime is in power now, because we do not know of any uh, uh, popular opposition to this regime. Uh, we know that the majority of Iranians do not want this regime. It is obvious, I think, to everyone, I, you cannot do a scientific uh, study of how many people are against this regime. But uh, I mean, when I was in Iran, uh, when, when I talked to people from different uh, backgrounds in Iran, they are not happy with this regime. And they would change the regime if there was a peaceful process from this regime to the other one. So I think it's the role of the international community right now to 
somehow make this regime as accountable as possible. And one of the things that I really want to talk about is the no to execution campaign that happened in Iran a few days ago. As I, uh, this, as I talked about earlier, there was a protest in Iran in, 2000, in 2019, November 2019. And three of the protesters uh, who were arrested by the regime, they escaped and they went to Turkey. And unfortunately, the government of Turkey returned them to Iran and they received a death sentence. And what happened was that it, and it was amazing. I was so proud to be Iranian last week that millions of Iranians, they came up with the hashtag no to execution, Adam Nakonit. And that became the, uh, that became a trend on Twitter. And it became one of the most popular uh, uh, Twitter storms or the, the most popular Twitter storms that the Iranians have staged. And that happened by ordinary Iranians and that happened by or, or Iranians inside Iran, outside of Iran. Everyone I knew was a part of it. Everyone I knew uh, that I could think of was part of it. And as a result of that, the government of Iran listened to that uh, call and uh, they are reviewing the case of those three young men who were uh, sentenced to execution. Thank so, you, Manziar. Yeah, I think yeah. on that really positive note, um, one of the answers is that international pressure does work and that's why we at ADL are so committed with the work of this panel and our task force that all of you are members of to continue to raise these issues, continue to educate and inform and to advocate. And so um, I want to thank you all. We've come to the end of our one hour time. We can talk about this for many, many more hours, but we really appreciate you all being with us. I want to thank Marjan, Johnny, Icon, Mazia for you taking your special time, precious time to be with us, to educate us, inform us a bit more. Um, this video will be uh, um, put on YouTube, so it has been recorded for those of you who want to reference it. And with that, I will turn it to Reina to say goodbye and thank you all very much. Thank you, Sharon. Thank you, everyone, for being with us today. Many thanks to our outstanding panelists. This ends our call. Have a wonderful day. Thank you.